Um, the first thank you is to the organizers of this conference. I think they've done an amazing job. My second thank you is specifically to, um, to Professor Palacios. He's done a wonderful job of pulling all of this together. And I think he actually deserves a round of applause. So for Professor Palacios, thank you. The next people I'd like to thank are the presenters. They've offered you a tremendous amount of information, from Dr. Cole yesterday to Dr. Applebaum today, Dr. Wendy Brown and others. They've done an amazing job of offering you the information that you need to help change Mexico's future. I'd also like to thank the people of Mexico. You have such an amazingly beautiful country, and all of you have been amazing to me, so thank you very much. But the most important people that I'd like to thank are you. Because we may be standing up here presenting, but the people that really count are you, the attendees. Because we can, we can publish our papers, we can do our science, we can present our information, but we cannot change the world. You change the world. You will touch more people's lives than I ever can. So it is you that deserve the applause, and it is you that deserve the recognition. So thank you for your time and your efforts, and thank you for your attention today. So, nutrient partitioning. What my presentation is going to focus on today is what happens to the food you eat. So often we say, oh, I can't eat dessert because it's going to end up on my thighs or it's going to end up in some part of my body I don't want, like my waist. But ultimately, today's, today's presentation, you'll have a better idea of what actually determines where that energy goes, how your body processes the nutrients and the energy that you consume each day. Because it's not just energy in and energy out. It's a little bit more complicated than that, as, as Dr. Applebaum presented in her presentation. So, on a really simple level, how many people have ever eaten a big piece of chocolate cake? I do on a regular basis. So, the idea behind today's presentation is to explain, will it end up around your waist, or will it end up in your muscles? Will you burn it off through activity, or will it be stored in your adipocytes, stored in your fat cells? So, from a scientific standpoint, Nutrient partitioning is defined as the metabolic fate of consumed energy substrates to anabolism, storage, and oxidation. Anabolism is just the building and maintenance of your body, the building and maintenance of tissue. Storage can be something as simple as the storage of energy as lipid in your fat cells, in your adipocytes. Or oxidation, powering your basal metabolic processes, keeping your brain function, keeping your heart function, powering your physical activity, go for a walk or a jog, keeping you alive. So the underlying foundational thought for is the competition for nutrient energy resources. So the underlying foundation is the competition between different cells. So all cells compete for energy. Your fat cells are competing with your muscle cells. They're competing with your neurons and your central nervous system. And a very simple example of this is if I go out and run a marathon yesterday, over the next few days, my body will partition. I'm sorry. Over the next few days, my body will partition the energy that I eat very, very differently than if I sat on a sofa watching the marathon on TV. So activity changes your nutrient partitioning. So let's do a thought experiment. So a thought experiment, we don't actually have participants, but we can in our mind picture what would occur over time. So I'd like you to picture two 18-year-old monozygotic twins, so identical twins. They have the same mother. They have the same father. They, they came from the same egg. The egg split in the womb and formed two human beings. So those are our participants. We have two participants. So in your mind, think about this. Two identical 18-year-old males. They have the same food environment, the same home environment. Their mom cooks their meals. So for 18 years, everything has been exactly the same. Same genes, same activity levels, same home environment, same food. They both have high levels of physical activity, so they'll be relatively lean. They run one hour per day. So for most of their day, they're going to school, they're doing different things, but for one hour per day, they run. And they run a lot, and they train for a marathon. But then one of them, decides to change what he's doing. 
So the first brother continues to run. He runs one hour every day, and he maintains his energy balance. But brother number two does something else and goes into positive energy balance. So he's now burning less calories than he's taking in, and he gains 20 kilograms, over 40 pounds, over the next three years. What do you think that individual will look like at the end of three years? So we have one brother who continued to run, neutral energy balance, stays lean. But what would the other brother look like? He'll be in positive energy balance and gain 20 pounds, excuse me, 20 kilograms, over 40 pounds. So while I said this was a thought experiment, it wasn't. It was actually done. I'd like you to meet Otto and Ewald. Otto continued to run. Ewald started lifting weights. How many of you, when I said he was in positive energy balance for three years, thought he'd be obese? I know I would. Someone being in positive energy balance for three years and gaining 20 kilograms? But if you noticed, he's not obese. So it's not the calories. It's not the food. It's what your body does with the food. And the term for that is nutrient partitioning. But what if instead of lifting weights, now Ewald, the muscular guy, he actually became a competitive weightlifter. But what if he sat in front of a video camera, excuse me, sat in front of a TV playing video games? What if he was really sedentary and he gained those same 20 kilograms? He would look like what most of you pictured, because I would normally have pictured an obese young man on his way to cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and early mortality. But the way he changed the, way he changed the time that he spent, he spent one hour per day differently just one hour per day, dramatically changed the nutrient partitioning. His energy went towards anabolism. So all cells compete for an energy. So Ewald, the muscular guy, the muscular individual, his muscles outcompeted his fat cells. So instead of going towards, towards storage, it went towards anabolism. He grew tissue and he got bigger. So the 20 kilograms that he gained over those three years did not end up going to his fat cells. So how you spend your money makes a difference. Now Otto's energy went towards oxidation. It went towards powering his physical activity. It went towards just moving him forward over time, keeping his heart and his lungs and everything working the way they should. So ultimately, nutrient partitioning is the result of the competition between your cells for energy. And if you're active, it will go towards oxidation and anabolism, building tissues, building a healthy body. If you're inactive, it goes towards storage. So obesity is the competitive dominance of fat cells. Fat cells are winning. So in the competition between your muscles and your fat cells, the fat cells are winning. And they win usually because there's more of them. So fat cells are out competing. Physical activity is an absolute essential, it's absolutely essential component for healthy nutrient partitioning. Because if he sat in front of a video camera, in front of a TV screen playing video games, he would be very unhealthy, as opposed to having more muscle and being a weightlifter and being healthier. So, now that you have a little bit more of an idea, which statement is more correct? You are what you eat. Is it the food? Are you what you eat? You won't show no, because he was eating lots of food. So it wasn't what he was eating, it was what his body was doing with what he was eating. So the correct statement is you are what your body does with what you eat. And there are a number of determinants of that. So, an overview. The determinants of nutrient partitioning. Physical activity is not the most important one. Body composition is. Individuals who have more fat mass, more fat cells, will partition more of the energy towards obesity. Ewald, the muscular brother, he was already lean. So when he gained muscle mass, or excuse me, he gained lean body mass rather than fat mass. But if he was already obese, those 20 kilograms, a good portion of that would have gone towards storage and fat mass. Physical activity. Ewald clearly showed that. Physical activity, how we spend our day is important. But we also have other determinants. Hormonal status. Puberty is a huge period of time of changing nutrient partitioning. Females gain more fat mass. They, gain more, they increase the number of fat cells they have and the size of their fat cells, getting ready for pregnancy. And pregnancy, 
Women gain weight, they gain fat mass. They also, again, increase the number of their fat cells as well as the size of their fat cells. And menopause, any woman who's gone through menopause, or someone who's over 50 or 55, knows very clearly that piece of chocolate cake that I was talking about really does end up on their thighs because their bodies have lost the anabolic stimulus of youth and they partition more calories towards storage. So they actually have to do more physical activity than they did previously because of their, because of their hormone status. Macronutrient composition. I put this last because it's really not, it doesn't have a great effect. Individuals who eat large amounts of saturated fat will partition more of the energy towards storage. And individuals who eat more protein will partition more of it towards lean body mass. But it's a very small component. The number one component is body composition, without a doubt. So body composition. Assuming inactivity and positive energy balance, obese individuals gain fat mass more easily than lean individuals. These publications that I'm listing underneath here, Forbes, and Diana Thomas, and Kevin Hall, these are mathematical equations showing very clearly that individuals who have more fat mass gain fat mass more easily for the same number of calories. So it's not just calories in and calories out, it's calories into what body? Are they going into a lean athlete? Or are they going into an obese child who's sitting in front of a TV? It makes a huge difference. So your body composition is determined in utero initially. The major component, the major determinant of your body composition is determined in the nine months before you're born. And it, and it determines all of your metabolic functioning, the size of your pancreas, your pancreatic beta cell function, which produces insulin, the number of fat cells, your adipocytes, the number of muscle cells, your myocytes. But the interesting things are what are the determinants of these interuterine effects? What's actually determining your body composition during pregnancy? And that comes to the, the competition between the mother's energy needs and the fetal energy needs. Now this is a somewhat complicated graph, so I'll walk you through it. On the y-axis, we have physical activity. So low physical activity would be someone who's sitting in front of a television all day long. High physical activity could be a subsistence farmer, someone who's working incredibly hard or someone who's exercising all day long. On the y-axis, we have maternal energy resources. This is the confluence of two things. The mother's body mass. Does she have a great deal of adiposity? She'd be over here. If she has a wonderful food environment, lots of food, kind of like all the food that we have out there, and the food for a buffet out here. Down here, low energy resources, a very thin woman. Think of sub-Saharan Africa. Think of India. Think of rural subsistence farmers who can't get enough food. They can't produce enough food, and they're working incredibly hard. So if you have a woman who has high levels of physical activity, incredibly high levels of physical activity, and they have restricted energy intake, they can't, have enough, they can't take in enough food to support their basal metabolic processes. When that woman is pregnant, they will produce a small for gestational age child. And that small for gestational age child is predisposed to cardiovascular disease, obesity, and all non-communicable chronic diseases. The baby on the left is two weeks old and weighs 1,200 grams. The baby on the right is two days old and weighs 3,700. The baby on the left is small for gestational age. You can see it has less muscle mass, it has less fat cells, yet it is still predisposed to obesity. Because as this child, as long as it's in a not modern environment, it will gain fat mass much more quickly because it has less muscle mass. The adipocytes outcompete the fat mass, and this baby is predisposed to cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, and obesity. But what if we have the converse? What if we have a mother with, excuse me, sorry, if we have a mother with excess resources, we have a mother who's obese, high level of adiposity, and she has low levels of physical activity. This is called the Pedersen hypothesis. The Pedersen hypothesis says that a mother's glycemic control, how well she controls her blood sugar, determines the size of her fetus. The child on the right is macrosomic, over five and a half kilograms. The child on the left is the healthy child. The child on the right was born to a diabetic mother. The mother could not control her blood glucose, so the child expanded. 
the normal metabolic sequelae, the normal metabolic consequences of pregnancy is a decrease in insulin resistance, excuse me, an increase in insulin resistance, a decrease in insulin sensitivity. This is the exact same thing that happens with inactivity. When you become inactive, you decrease your insulin sensitivity and you increase your insulin resistance. So when you combine the normal metabolic processes of pregnancy with the metabolic processes that are induced from inactivity, you produce larger babies. So this brings me to the second half of my presentation, the childhood obesity epidemic, mother's physical activity and nutrient partition. Because ultimately, if your body composition is initially determined in utero, and your mother's physical activity is necessary to determine her glycemic control, and her glycemic control determines the body composition of the child, the mother's physical activity determines the nutrient partitioning for that child forever. A mother's physical activity determines her child's nutrient partitioning forever. So this was a New York Times article that profiled some of my work. I began looking at women's physical activity and we examined 45 years of women's use of time in the home. How active were they in the household? And what we found from 1960s to 2010, mothers, stay-at-home, excuse me, stay-at-home women went from doing around 33 hours of housework, so that's cooking, cleaning, childcare, clothing maintenance, otherwise known as laundry, down to 16.5. They decreased their physical activity by over two hours per day. That's a dramatic decline in physical activity. Remember Ewald, the muscular guy? He changed his physical activity one, one hour per day and had a huge change on his body. So imagine changing your physical activity for two hours per day. That led to a dramatic decline in energy expenditure. So we have a decline in physical activity and we have a decline in physical activity energy expenditure from 6,000 calories per week in the 1960s to 3,500 calories in 2010. That's over 300 calories per day. Now to stay in neutral energy balance, they would have to eat 300 calories less per day. How many people think that we're eating less calories per day than we did in the 1960s? And we're certainly not eating 300 calories less per day. But if you don't, you're going to store more of that energy as fat. With that huge decrement, that huge decrease in physical activity, and that huge decrease in physical activity energy expenditure, we had a dramatic increase in sedentary behavior. Screen-based media, playing, watching a computer, watching a TV, went from 8.3 hours to 16.5 hours. In other words, we cut the amount of activity in half and we doubled the amount of time we spent watching television. Think about that. Women were doing half as much housework and sitting twice as much. So, Given my background in energy physiology and my interest in the next generation, because I think that science can improve the human condition, and that was important to me, I immediately wanted to look at mothers specifically. So we looked at 45-year trends in mothers' use of time. And what we did was we created an activity variable. So it was anything that made women active. Exercise, housework, cooking, cleaning, anything other than occupational work. And what we found with mothers with older children went from 32 hours per week of being active down to 21. That's a decrease of two hours per day. Now we know that, the scientific community knows, that physical activity patterns tend to be fairly consistent over time. So these mothers with children were probably physically inactive each generation. But in concert with that decrease in physical activity was an increase in sedentary time from 18 to 25 hours. So they decreased their physical activity and increased their sedentary behavior. Now this was with children, uh, mothers with older children. Mothers with younger children had an even bigger decrease. They went from 44 hours per week. And any, any mothers here who have young kids knows you work a lot. But you worked a lot more in the 1960s than you did in 2010. They went from 44 down to 30. That's two hours per day. And their sedentary time went from 17 to 23. So it mirrored what women in our, in, these are US data. So it mirrored what women in the US are doing. So it went from two hours of decrease to another hour of increase in sedentary behavior. And this, went, this led to a huge decrement in calories. Went from 7,700 calories down to about 600 calories in both mothers with older children and mothers with younger children. 
Now, with mothers with younger children, that's about 225 calories per day. And again, mothers probably aren't eating 225 less calories per day. So we have decrease in physical activity, decrease in physical activity energy expenditure, and a dramatic increase in sedentary behavior. This is an incredibly disturbing slide for anyone who studies physical activity and studies the effects of inactivity on pregnancy. 20%, this is US data, 20% of pregnant women self-report spending five hours or more watching television per day. Five hours per day. Think about that. The muscular brother Ewald changed his life one hour per day. Imagine what five hours of sitting in front of a television does to the growing child. We have bigger moms. The UK, Australia, US, Mexico, over time, women have gotten bigger. Dr. Brown's presentation yesterday showed very clearly that women have gotten bigger over time. Each generation is getting bigger. And we see with waist circumference, you've heard tremendously about waist circumference all week long. So the waist circumference gets bigger when you become inactive because physical activity targets your visceral adiposity. And over time, mothers' physical activity has gone down, their waist circumference has increased. This is data from the, the US National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, where I used objectively measured physical activity to measure both men and women's physical activity, objectively. So we have activity, oops, sorry. We have activity here, and we have men and women. And you see there's a very clear inverse relationship between waist circumference and activity. And it's reciprocally causal, which means individuals who are less active get bigger waistlines. And when you get bigger waistlines, you become more inactive. The scientific community has known since the 1950s that bigger individuals move less. So every pound that you gain, you decrease your strength to weight ratio. And by decreasing your strength to weight ratio, you become more inactive. So inactivity drives waist circumference, waist circumference and excess weight gain drives inactivity. So the maternal resources hypothesis. I'll read this. With each passing generation, mothers have become increasingly physically inactive, sedentary, and obese, thereby potentially predisposing children to an increased risk of inactivity, adiposity, and chronic non-communicable diseases, such as cardiovascular disease, diabetes, obesity, cancer, and all-cause mortality. Mothers' inactivity are driving their children's obesity. That child then transitions through puberty and gains even more fat mass. And when she has a child, she predisposes the next generation to obesity. And we've been having this over and over and over again. And the United States, unfortunately, is leading the way. So in summary, I like to keep my presentation short because it's been a long, long, wonderful conference. But first point, it's not the food. It's not what you're eating. It's what your body is doing with what you're eating. So this second statement's really important. People always want to say, oh, it's saturated fat, or it's carbohydrate, or it's sugar, or it's something else in the environment. It's what your body is doing with that. When someone says positive energy balance leads to obesity, they don't know what they're talking about because they're ignoring that it's going into a body. It's important that you pay, take it, pay attention to that body. And if the body is obese, yes, you will store more of that energy in your fat cells, and you become more obese. All cells compete for energy. The only way to reverse this is to increase your activity, to increase your muscle cells so they can compete with the fat cells, just the way Ewald, the muscular brother, did. Or Otto, just be exercising. Physically active will allow your muscles to outcompete your fat cells. When you sit here, your fat cells are winning. Sorry. Obesity, again, is the result of fat cells outcompeting other cells. Body composition is the most important determinant, followed by physical activity. But your mother's physical activity determined your initial body composition. And if you haven't done anything to alter that body composition over your life, by lifting weights, or running, or trying to increase your muscle mass, your fate was determined a long time ago. Your fate was determined those nine months in utero, the prenatal period before you were born. So at this point, the only thing you have that's modifiable is physical activity. So if you are already obese, physical activity is really the only answer. 
Now, our physical activity affects our health. But if you're a female and you're thinking of becoming a mom, your physical activity also affects the next generation. So ultimately, the, the solution to the childhood obesity epidemic, mothers are the solution. I mean, from a male's perspective, I've always thought women had all the power. Women have always ruled the world. I think from, most males think that way. But in this situation, it's very true because only a mother can be physically active for her child. Only she can protect her child from the effects of inactivity. So I'd like to end with a quote. The hand that rocks the cradle rules the health of the next generation. Mothers determine the health of the next generation as they have for millennia. Science is about improving the human condition. Science is about making tomorrow better than today. And the only way we can do that is with information. And Dr. Applebaum talked about that a great deal. Information and communication. And that's why I started my presentation saying, you're the most important people here. Because you can take this information and you can make a better Mexico. Mexico can be better in the next generation. Physical activity is the only answer. We can't change our food environment to go back to hunter-gathering. We can't remove 200 calories or 300 calories per day. And I would not suggest that women do more housework, because even if you did more housework, the labor and time-saving devices, we have washing machines, and we have dishwashers, and we also have a TV. Previously, you had to stand and you'd wash your dishes by hand. Now, you put them in a dishwasher, sit down and watch TV, and that's unfortunate. So we can't go back to the 1960s. We can't go back to our evolutionary past. But what we can do is add activity back to our daily lives. We can add activity, active transport, have our children walk to school, bike to school, not be driven to school. When a child is driven to school and then spends all day at a desk and then comes home and plays video games, it happens in the United States all the time. And we wonder why we have a childhood obesity epidemic. So mothers are the solution, because if a mother, if a mom is inactive, her children will be active. In the same way when a mother smokes, there's a much higher increase, a greater risk for her children to smoke. But if a mother is active, her children will be more active. And she's teaching her female children, her little girls, to be better mothers by teaching them physical activity. So ultimately, science can improve the human condition. We can have a better tomorrow. And that's up to you, because only you can change the world. I can only talk about it. So thank you very much.